The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Well, let's get started. I'd like to introduce Lewis Watts. It's a great pleasure to have him here. Lewis is a professor um, at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He actually has an architectural degree. He started studying architecture in graduate school and then drifted towards photography. His undergraduate degree from Berkeley is in political science, and so he came to photography uh, after um, an undergraduate career in the liberal arts. And Lou taught for many years at Berkeley a photography course that, before I met him, I had heard about it from my Berkeley colleagues. It was known for all the landscape architecture and architecture and planning students that, that took it um, and used photography as a way with Lou of investigating their own culture and, and other cultures and the way they were expressed in urban form. Lou is, uh, has had a, a distinguished career. He's had many solo exhibitions of his photographs, uh, been in many, many group exhibitions uh, all over, including the Smithsonian. His, uh, his work is in the collection of the Smithsonian and uh, San Francisco, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco. He's also, as for a photographer, done a number of in unusual things, um, including uh, working with the National Park Service on, and planners on a heritage trail in Richmond, California, documenting um, the area where the shipyards were during the Second World War. And he's recently just published a book on um, the San Francisco Fillmore, which I think he'll tell you a little bit about the culture of jazz uh, in San Francisco. It gives me a great pleasure to, um, to have Lewis here. And I won't say any more. Uh, I, he really needs no more introduction at all. Thank you. Welcome. Well, thank you. Well, let's see. I'm, um, I actually went to high school in Boston some 40 years ago, and I, for some reason I've only been back a few times, so it's interesting to be here, and it sort of brings up some things from my past. Um, but, um, a lot of my work is informed by, um, I think, migration. Um, my, fa my father, both of my parents are from the South. Uh, my father's from Georgia, my mother's from uh, Arkansas, and I was actually born in Little Rock, Arkansas, but I was conceived in Seattle because my father was discharged from Fort Lewis in Tacoma and went into Seattle and um, ended up getting a job with the Urban League. And my mother came to join him and then went back to Little Rock because she knew the doctor. So it's been helpful when I'm photographing in the South, I can say, I I'm, I'm from here, even though I just was there for four months. Um, so a lot of my work, um, actually so photography caught me when I was a, in the first year of a um, graduate program for non-majors uh, in architecture at Berkeley. And I um, ended up actually getting a degree in design rather than a, a master's of architecture. Um, and have had, had the opportunity to, to teach uh, primarily um, uh, seniors and graduate students in the College of Environmental Design and a few others. Berkeley does not really have a photo program. Um, but it was interesting to me that, um, uh, A, most of the architects did not want to do, do architectural photography. They were interested in sort of uh, expand, uh, exploring the medium kind of in other ways, and then they would uh, use it in their research later. But in the class, they wanted, I basically taught it as a fine arts class. Um, and my own work, um, I was very interested in photographing in West Oakland, which is um, an area that was populated during World War II by a lot of African Americans um, who came to work in the shipyards uh, during World War II. Basically, World War II, as most of you know, ended the Depression. And all of a sudden, there was work when the war effort began. And what I noticed in West Oakland were there all these sort of evidences of the southern background of either the inhabitants or the parents of the inhabitants. 
and how those traces were left in the landscape. And that's what I was interested in photographing. I'm the son of um, two social scientists. And it's funny, when I first started doing photography, I said, well, all this sociology and history I've left behind. But of course, it informs all the work that I do. So what I want to show you is a, 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 a couple of projects. One is a, um, a visual history project. Um, I'll talk a little bit about it. I decided not to show slides, but this signage project was um, part of a team that was um, uh, commissioned by the, the, the develop, redevelopment agency of the city of Richmond, which is just nor uh, north of uh, Berkeley in um, San Francisco, and which was during World War II the um, site of the Kaiser Shipyards, and uh, it was also a place where a lot of people from all over the country came because there was work. It was the first place where there was an integrated workforce. It was the birth of Rosie the Riveter, um, where women were actually welding as it's supposed to riveting, but, um, but where women were uh, an integral part of the workforce. Um, it was also a place that had segregated housing and um, uh, kind of sort of had patterns that were happening in other parts of the country. But there was actually very little trace. So um, a, what uh, people had been trying to do was to make the um, sort of access to the bay. There was only something like a half mile access. And uh, there's now almost total access. And eventually, there's going to be a trail that'll um, circumambulate the bay. And, and like I can ride from my house in Port Richmond to Emeryville or to Oakland without bringing in traffic going just along the bay. And so in the area in Richmond, there are these signs that have um, Dorothea Lang and other people's photographs and text of uh, the social impact when the population of Richmond quadrupled in a course of six months. So it was interesting to me to uh, both collect that and also place that in, a, in an area where people who are using the the space for recreation, the trail, can actually see um, this history which had been hidden. So another um, uh, history project that I've been working on actually for about the last 10 or 15 years is um, based on a set of photographs I found in a shoeshine parlor. Um, uh, and this is uh, Red Powell, or uh, hopefully this will be. Hold on just a sec. OK. This is uh, Red Powell in front of his uh, shine parlor. And Red, uh, like a lot of um, uh, barbers and beauticians, and in this case, uh, shine parlors, was actually an a, uh, archivist. And he had photographs of every one who had uh, been in this area in San Francisco, the Fillmore District, which um, had uh, sort of instantly became a little Harlem in the early 40s. Uh, when um, uh, people came west, and in San Francisco, the only place where there was available housing was what had been Japantown, because the Japanese had been recently interned. And it was, uh, it had already sort of had a built in um, uh, set of, of uh, institutions that were um, sort of taken over by African Americans. There were already, there were clubs at, at its height, there were probably eight or nine jazz clubs. There were three African American owned hotels. Um, and there was a critical mass um, of, of people who had come to work in both um, Hunters Point and in the East Bay in the, the shipyards. And so um, when I walked in in 1989, uh, someone had sent me to a shine parlor. I got really excited and I said, wow, can I, photograph your walls, and he was having none of it. He basically threw me out of his club, of his shop. So I came back a month later armed with some people that knew him, and he was gone, and the walls were bare. Um, here's a picture of the, um, you can see, if you can see in the walls, there's a picture of Bobby Kennedy and Sitting Bull and Joseph Stalin and Jackie Robinson. I mean, really had, and on other walls, there were a lot of uh, jazz musicians. So. Um, what he was gone when I came back, and it turned out uh, after five years of searching that he had had a stroke literally two weeks after I'd seen him. And so in the mid 90s, I was working for the redevelopment agency, who will um, come up a little later in the story, uh, because they were uh, attempting to make a jazz preservation district in an area where very, most of the trace of African Americans had disappeared in the late 60s due to redevelopment. 
And I, for the hundredth time, I asked uh, Reggie Pettis, the barber in the barbershop across the street, do you know what happened to the photographs? And he, he said, oh, they're in my back room. So what had happened was when, when Red, um, who's on the uh, left, had a stroke, uh, the landlord took all the photographs down um, and was about to throw them out, and Reggie rescued them, and they'd been sitting in his back room. Um, and a lot of them were in, in uh, pretty bad shape. So this was the opportunity, in this case 10 years ago or 8 years ago, to learn Photoshop. And um, actually I had learned and I had students show me Photoshop probably 4 or 5 times. But I really had not, I was shooting a film and I didn't really have that much interest. But this was a project that was really important. And so with Photoshop I was able to learn to restore the images. And uh, eventually they were using a report and then uh, my friends at the San Francisco Art Commission said, well, you need to show these, people need to see them. So they were uh, exhibited a number of times, um, some people doing research on the, um, the um, uh, area who were doing films used them and, and they were used in a uh, neighborhood documentary that KQED, the uh, PBS station in San Francisco, did on the Fillmore, and I was an advisor for that. So in this group of photographs were photographs of life in this community, um, a lot of pictures of entertainers. This is a vaudevillian. This picture is probably from the 40s because the in front of the um, California theater, and you can see that the uh, movie posters are World War II vintage. Here's a picture of Charlie Parker in front of, uh, in, inside Jimbo's Bop City, um, an after hours place where a lot of musicians would come to jam after they came. Here's a publicity shot of Joe Lewis with Joe Lewis liquor and um, the, uh, some, some older gentleman in front of the Burger King on Fillmore said that that was the worst rot gut they ever tasted. So it was interesting that I would, get, eventually, when I first got the photographs, there was no labels, I didn't know any of the people, and as they started to have a public life, I started meeting people, um, and I started meeting other photographers and other people who had, had um, collections. This woman was named Vera the Body. Here's a photograph taken probably after the Japanese came back of a very uh, multicultural uh, wedding party. And people said that that was one of the things that this community was um, very multicultural. I did a, eventually did a public art uh, piece on the street and I remember seeing an old man in front of one of the posters and he said he came every day because it was the best time of his life. Here's a picture of Chet Baker uh, inside Jimbo's. There's, if you see, um, uh, just to the uh, left is Ella Fitzgerald, and next to her is, is uh, someone I had a lot of pictures of whose name was um, uh, Robert Lee. And I called Robert Lee probably, I tried to, to meet with him probably over the course of two years, and he always put me off. He said, oh, my Cadillac's in the garage, or I've got to go to the hospital, and then he died. And so I was never able to talk to him, and I know he would have had the, some of these stories. Here's a picture of him at uh, Jack's, which was a famous bar. A lot of the clubs um, had um, pictures of, of uh, jazz and other entertainers on the, uh, um, painted on the back of the seats. And I was told that this woman is actually now a, a prominent socialite in San Francisco who probably would not be happy to know this photograph still existed. Um, here's a, a barber uh, shop where um, someone's getting his hair processed. Um, this is uh, one of the publicity pictures. This was a group called the Four Naturals, and I actually have three or four of these, this kind of motif, where the pianist, who was always different, was at this kind of um, rounded faux keyboard. The pianist is actually Frank Jackson, who um, I met and who actually uh, gave, uh, contributed photographs and oral history. Here's another photograph of him. Um, and when we, there's an exhibit of this work and um, a lot of the musicians from the period played. Um, but here's a picture, Frank um, celebrated his 80th birthday uh, a couple of months ago at Yoshi's in Oakland. So he's still playing and that's been thrilling to meet people who I've been looking at photographs of and actually hear them playing. Um, when I did a neighborhood walk and there was a, a gentleman who kept correcting me as I was sort of saying things as I believed them and it turned out he was uh, Wesley Johnson Jr. and his father owned the Texas Playhouse which was basically sort of a hangout for uh, people from Texas and his signature was sort of wearing that white 10 gallon Stetson hat. Here's a pic here he is posing with uh, T-Bone Walker who was a star of the day. 
Um, uh, and if, you, if you've heard him play, you know where Chuck Berry, Chuck Berry got all his licks. So he, the, the, after meeting with Wesley, he actually gave us his father's albums, and it turned out his father had given Red a lot of the work that he had on his walls. So there's sort of all these connecting, and the sort of collection of images and archive kept growing and growing. Um, here's a picture of some church lady. So it was a nightclub, but I think people would use it for other things. Um, on the walls, he had these murals. Um, these were all Texas musicians. Saunders King was uh, well-known and had a hit and a star in San Francisco. And in fact, his daughter is married to Carlos Santana. Um, I think, who else is here? Uh, John Hinton, I'm not sure of, but Ivory Joe Hunter was a pianist from Texas. So in his album, I noticed there were all these paintings, and I saw them in other people's photographs that were on the walls. They were done by um, uh, an artist named, um, I'm going to probably get his name wrong, I think it's Hinton, and he actually designed the logo for Fisherman's Wharf and designed the Oakland Paramount, which is a really strong art deco. So I kept seeing these paintings, and one day I got a letter um, from someone said, I have the paintings in my basement. Um, here's a picture of, of Wesley with his two, a bartender and his partner. And so I went to see um, this gentleman, and there were these paintings I'd been looking at for five years. They're absolutely beautiful, and they're, they're, they're uh, gold flaked, and they're 50 years old and in incredible shape. So they're in the exhibit, um, which is thrilling. And, and it turned out when the Texas Playhouse was being um, demolished, as were a lot of the clubs in the late uh, 60s, the Ukrainian contractor said, oh, great, I can uh, bring these paintings home and, and salvage the plywood. So when he brought them home, his wife said, you will do no such thing. That's, this is art. So they gave the paintings to their neighbors, African-American neighbors who had grown up in the Fillmore. And Willie had kept them, I mean, it, he'd kept them in a dry, uh, dark room for the last 30 years. So he was, again, an incredible conserv uh, conservator. His, um, here's a photograph of Lionel Hampton. And it turned out I'd been looking at this photograph for a long time, and this is um, Robert Broussard, who is the uncle of my friend Tony Broussard, who's a, a writer who does a remembrance of him. And they lived in the East Bay, but they would get dressed up every weekend. This was his sweetheart. They never married, but they were, uh, went together for a long time, and they would dress and go to the Fillmore every weekend. And so here he is in front of this painting that I've actually now touched. It's sort of... It, um, one of the, the clubs that was prominent in this neighborhood was the Fillmore, the same Fillmore that some of you have probably heard of and that Bill Graham eventually ran. But before that, it was a rhythm and blues venue um, run by Charles Sullivan, who was the, considered the mayor of, of the Fillmore. And here's a poster of Little Richard uh, playing at the Fillmore. Uh, I love there was this sort of aesthetic. I've seen all over the, the country, at the Howard Theater in Washington, at the, the Regal in Chicago, there was a certain way of doing offset printing in rhythm uh, blues venues. So here's uh, Little Richard who's returning from a triumph in England, and um, uh, John Goddard, who now has an incredible a record store in Mill Valley, California, was a 14-year-old kid who took the bus in to see Little Richard and t took a picture with the brownie. And Little Richard had this left-handed guitarist who was j really frustrating John because he kept getting in the way of Little Richard. And that guitarist was James Marshall Hendricks. This is, I think, one of the few. And Little Richard fired him after six months because he was too weird, which I thought was quite interesting. So anyway, in this collection, here's a, f a picture in front of um, Melrose Records, and in the window is a, a sign for a, a hit of the day called Bilbo is Dead. Bilbo was a governor of Mississippi who was a strong segregationist, and when he died, someone made a hit in celebration of that fact. So in the meantime, um, this sort of collection is growing, and I met a, friend, a woman, um, Janet Alvarado, whose father had come to San Francisco in the first wave of Filipino immigrants. There was sort of a bachelor society. And he had taught himself photography, and he worked in the kitchen in the Presidio, the army base in San Francisco. And as is the case, a lot of people of color worked in the Presidio. And he lived in, in the Fillmore and went to, to uh, clubs. He also did a lot of photography of, of Filipino and Hispanic communities. And in fact, the Smithsonian has an exhibit that his daughter um, organized. Um, but he has thousands of four by five negatives. So he, um, this is a picture in a house party that he took 
um, that contributed to the book. And then here's a photograph done by Steve Jackson, who is the official photographer of the um, Jimbo's Bob City, which is, I said was a, a well-known uh, after-hours place. There was actually a Bob City in, in New York, and um, someone, uh, Slim Gaylord, who was a musician and tried to be an entrepreneur, opened up a club called Vout City. If you know about Slim and Slam, Vout, and Vout O'Rooney was a, a saying of the day, but it didn't last very long. So... Um, uh, it was taken over by um, uh, someone else, and it basically opened at 2 a.m. Uh, you had to bring your own liquor, and a lot of the musicians who were playing would come. There was a sort of house rhythm section, and people would show up. So on the, this is on the cover of the book, and uh, on the left is John Handy, who lives in the Bay Area, who's well-known. That's Pointy Poindexter who, next to him. Uh, and then next to him was, at the time, a young saxophone player, John Coltrane, and next to him was Frank Fisher. So um, a couple of months ago, when the exhibit opened, we had a, a concert with the Fillmore Preservation Big Band, and two of the re surviving members, that's John Handy, second from the left, and Frank Fisher next to him. So again, it was just thrilling, and they still could play. Um, they, they were able to play, and I, I love that whole thing coming together. So what happened was it was sort of move afoot to uh, redevelop this area. It, was, it had a stock of uh, Victorian houses, um, and um, I have, we have uh, photographs from the redevelopment agency where buildings were numbered and a lot of them were torn down, and a lot of people were displaced with the idea that they would be put on a list and be the first to be able to come back. And so it turned out that much of the Fillmore looked like this for years and years, that, that um, the buildings seemed to be, people were displaced and the buildings were torn down quickly, but it turned out I think one family on that list was able to resettle. So um, it obviously was devastating to a lot of people, and it's no accident that a large percentage of the people who died in Guyana with Jim Jones, who had a church right next to the Fillmore Auditorium, were people from the Fillmore or the offspring of people. Um, and there was no trace. There was there are people. I think people have studied. There are planners here who that the Fillmore has been studied a lot as a sort of attempt at um, redevelopment that didn't go very well. And some people say that it was the intention of the developers that they didn't like the idea of there in a prominent area in San Francisco was African American community. It turned out a lot of them were displaced to other places, but some of them ended up in the area. Um, uh, so it was important to me, uh, the first sort of pup, that, that to exhibit that work, and then this is actually um, sort of storefront installation that's on the side of some of the clubs. And um, some of that, the, the, the area is being redeveloped. Uh, a jazz club, Yoshi's, which is in the East Bay, is going to be moving across the street from where this is. But it, it's basically... Preservation district. It's not really the. It will not be the same, and it won't be the same community. But I think the book and um, is an attempt, and the people who lived in the community say that the book is important to them because at least now that history has a public face. So that was um, that was me sort of manipulating and looking at and handling other people's photographs and manipulating with the idea of trying to bring them back to I think the the condition that I, I think that the uh, photographers wanted. So my own work, um, I'll show a little bit of the work, uh, the first kind of work I've done. West Oakland was always a place that I was interested in photographing, and I'm very interested in markings. Some of you know Walker Evans. Um, you'll see uh, sort of evidence of my interest in kind of signs and what they mean, and then I'm also interested in kind of symbolic. So I thought that this, I was told that this ghost town meant that this was a crack house, but it turns out this community, which is about a 20 block area in West Oakland, calls itself ghost town. And I've seen in, um, uh, people sell t-shirts. It's sort of like a sense of identity. This is, um, uh, can you read the text? Yeah. Um, I sort of asked people, there was a, a Palestinian uh, market at the end of this block, and I asked them about the signage, and they either didn't want to talk about it, and I asked people in the street, but it's obviously um, interesting and sort of reflective of changing demographics in this particular neighborhood. And then here's basically uh, a kind of more conscious marking of a nightclub facade in West Oakland. 
And I love, this is probably one of the first pictures I took when I decided to become a photographer. And this is, uh, I, I think, really beautifully hand-painted and very reminiscent of what I've seen in rural Louisiana. And actually, right after I took the picture, the sign disappeared. And I was told later when I had a show at the Oakland Museum that um, the house was sold not long after I took it. But uh, it basically, someone probably came in the 40s and 50s, uh, had chickens in the backyard, and just like they had done in Texas or Louisiana, you could go get fresh poultry. Uh, this is, uh, some people have asked me about this picture. Uh, some people interpret it as someone incarcerated sort of behind um, uh, walls. Um, and I've been a couple, number of other interpretations. The other thing is this was at one time 512, which I thought was interesting. I don't know if you can read it. Um, but it's basically uh, probably retail space that someone's using now to live in, and they put up this photograph to, for both privacy and as a kind of reflection. Here's a converted storefront church, and this again reminded me of the South. Um, this, this church has since, and this building has since uh, uh, had other uses. This picture was taken in 93. There's always a lot of that um, kind of uh, change in terms of how things are used. But this whole idea of improv improvising and how that gets reflected in the environment is really important to me. This is a photograph that um, led me to meet Anne Spurn. I heard that uh, my friend Walter Hood, who uh, I've done some work, was showing slides uh, at West Oakland and some things that he was doing. And I guess either in the middle of his lecture or right afterwards, she um, yelled out for him to stop and say, what's the story with that photograph? And um, which shows her incredibly good taste. Um, <laughs> but. Um, What's interesting about it, you know, one of the rules is you shouldn't shoot in the middle of the day because um, the angle of sun makes it harder to see people. But of course, uh, I photograph when I can, and I wouldn't have been able to make this image without if it had not been in the middle of the day. And the the couple things going on: the Safeway cart is the basket. The um, you know what they're doing is played out on the street, and um, they didn't even. They didn't even look up. They were they were really into playing. This was uh, this uh, domino game at the new Chicago, new California barbershop had been going on almost continuously for about twenty years. It's no longer in existence, also. And when when I photographed, I photographed probably maybe over the course of a week. And when I first saw this picture, I really didn't like it compositionally. But this is really the photograph. The photograph is about their hands and how their hands kind of represent the kind of community and communion that they have. Plus, I think he had a good hand. So then right next door was this guy with a raccoon on a leash. And in the barbershop, they were taking bets as to who would win in a fight between a pit bull and the raccoon. And I think I put my money on the raccoon, although this raccoon had actually been caught as a, a What's a young raccoon? A pup, a, and um, was was uh, trained. And I know when I used to live in Wren County, raccoons would come in to my house through the window, go into the kitchen, open the the counter, take the lid off the ki cat kibble, take their fill, and put the lid back, and then leave. And did that regularly. So I'm not sure. I was talking earlier about the whole notion of. Um, how do you photograph strangers? And I think this photograph sort of uh, is interesting that I asked her if I could photograph. This is actually in East Oakland. And I think this photograph, I think she's looking at me much more intently than I'm looking at her, which I think is the photograph. So I was very interested in uh, people would tell stories of arriving in West Oakland in 1943 with $10 in their pocket and how they had raised a family, you know, two or three generations. And there's a really beautiful um, old uh, uh, railroad station, which is closed because of seismic conditions. And so there's a new one that uh, is in Jack London Square. And I was interested in photographing it. And so I went one day, and there was a guy waiting in a, a Cadillac with these really beautiful cowboy boots. And like a fool, I said, uh, could you move? Because I want to photograph the building. You know, I immediately regretted it. And so um, I got another chance. I went back. And here's a woman who just come from Stockton dressed up for her daughter's wedding. And so I sort of saw that. This was taken in 97. But I saw that as kind of being an indication of that idea of transference and the, the kind of indicating these stories I heard. Um, 
And I love that the shopping cart in the ghetto is, a, is the SUV of the ghetto and absolutely is a convenience, uh, a means for transferring. Uh, in some cases, there's like lines of them. It's also uh, important in the economy in terms of recycling. So, um, uh, so that's sort of West Oakland. And here's a photograph taken in Havana, Florida. Um, I sort of read about the whole notion, West African notion of the swept, swept clean yard, which is all over the south. Um, so here was an example. This is a swept clean yard with a satellite dish. Um, I went to Beale Street and saw this peeling mural. Some people think that's Bessie Smith. Some think it's, it's Billie Holiday. Um, couldn't find it when I was there a couple of months ago, so it was gone. Uh, Bradford Marcellus used it on the cover of one of his albums. But I sort of saw it as symbolic. The, sort of Beale Street, the same thing happened. It was about to be... Um, it was a thriving African-American community. It was about to be um, destroyed and basically now a tourist area. So the culture was um, the means for it to survive, but it's not, it, it had to take another reiteration. I'm real interested in what's going to happen in New Orleans, and we'll talk more about that. Um, this is Tallulah, Louisiana, um, kind of a bayou uh, light tree. This is in the third ward in Houston. I... Um, was uh, worked with a number of uh, uh, architects um, in at that, that time in Rice. They had a conference on shotgun houses, and the uh, Project Row House, which is in the, uh, the Third Ward, is um, a series of, of shotgun houses that were sort of reconfigured. Some of you may know about it. And artists come and do in, do in residencies and installation. And it's actually run by um, uh, unwed mothers <coughs> who um, sort of administer it. But the neighborhood in Houston was very interesting to me. And here's, you know, that sort of ongoing. I've seen domino games in Kingston, Jamaica, all over the south in Harlem. Um, again, I'm always interested in the sort of stories that get told on the street. Um, the Third Ward is the home of uh, um, Barbara Jordan and uh, Mickey Leland and Lightning Hopkins. A lot of people in the Third Ward come from the Third Ward. This uh, Project Row house in the background and this sort of interesting story in the foreground. So this is sort of the courtyard of, of um, Project Row House. So Project Row House in some ways was kind of um, formalized, but the shotgun house is very interesting. Uh, it's like the perfect design pre-air uh, conditioning because of the cross-ventilation, high ceilings. And um, I know uh, I've had a chance to stay with friends of mine in Baton Rouge. It's actually a really nice kind of uh, house. We can't use them in California because you can just put them on concrete blocks, but that won't work for seismic. So um, I uh, love going to New York. I really regret not being able to go this trip. Um, but here the, the, you'll sort of see kind of similar kind of references. I'm very interested in especially how the sort of um, the, the African-American church, which I have some problems with, but, but also, which I think is incredible, thank God for it, because it, it's a source of a lot of my photography. I have some things that I really admire about it also. Um, but you can kind of see this referencing the thing. I, this is in Harlem. Uh, this is actually a, a Haitian uh, church. Um, and I, I just love that kind of evidence of hand and expression, a collective expression of faith as shown in a visual sense. Now, I may have it wrong. I think this is 127th Street in Harlem. I believe it, that it was designed by the Astors, but it looks like Southern architecture to me. So I, I actually love um, kind of this little one block with uh, kind of scale and um, architecture, which seems much different than New York. Um, I was scheduled to do a residency in New Orleans, um, actually this, during the summer. And I was working on my book, so it was delayed. And then all of a sudden, Katrina hit, so I was not able to go. So I went. Um, I went to New York um, and stay, actually stayed in Brooklyn and photographed a, sort of uh, some examples of both gentrification and people fighting it. Um, I was spent a little time in Washington, and then I went to Chicago, where um, a friend of mine who I remember as being in the Black Panthers is now an alderman and was organizing. Um, her district and uh, just north of uh, Wrigley Field on the north side and instead of the recurring pattern where a lot of people were being displaced she was um, um, sort of having 
community-based redevelopment. And she had seen the Fillmore um, project and was interested in, in me talking to them about doing public art and kind of expressions of history in the, the sort of area that they were communicating. And I hadn't been to Chicago in 30 years and um, got a chance to go to Cabrini Green, um, which is just barely left, but um, uh, was kind of wandering around and saw some people with video and there was a group that was interviewing people who were to, uh, trying to prevent them from being displaced because a lot of people have been displaced and they were going to actually go to the UN with, with interviews. So I had seen photographs of it. I think the Good Times was, was based in Cabrini Green and I've been hearing about it for years. Um, and there's this whole thing about these exterior um, corridors and like three foot square elevators and incredible mass. And I'd seen photographs about it and I had to photograph it. Um, it was very interesting. Um, uh, and this was sort of my attempt to get back to photographing after having been working on other projects. And we were talking about it earlier. I wasn't sure if I was still a photographer. I had to kind of work my way back through it. So uh, from there, I went to see my friend uh, uh, Laura Lawson, who la teaches landscape and who I worked on a book of community gardens with. And she had been talking about East St. Louis. So she took me to East St. Louis. Um, this is a bridge that um, I didn't, you know, I heard about East St. Louis. It's the home of Miles Davis. It's probably the source of one of the large, the, the most, um, the biggest race riots um, in the country, in the history of the country. And there was a bridge where you could walk to St. Louis that has been closed. That's, this has been closed, I think, for the last 50 years. And this is sort of the yellow brick road where you can kind of see the archway from this bridge um, that's sort of in uh, disrepair. Um, I was interested in this, the, the kind of results, the Onyx Club. There was a Club Alabama, which I know there was one in Central Avenue, and there was also one in San Francisco. That seemed to be a recurring theme. Um, so that was... Uh, it, both interesting uh, to me and both kind of places that I, I'm going to go back and do some more work. Um, um, so I'm going to show you a little bit of a color work. I've been kind of shifting back and forth. I got a dig well, I got a, um, my, I moved and gave up my dark room and then simultaneously got a job in Santa Cruz and wasn't sure if I was going to, to be moving there. I'm not. Um, and uh, sort of simultaneously to me working on the book, I started doing output digitally and started doing more color. I didn't do, I did some color and I printed color, but because I didn't have access, I um, had, and I really liked black and white, I started doing, I, I did color all along, but I kind of started actualizing it. This is another nightclub facade in East Oakland. This is in Richmond, a sort of a nicely a, um, appointed tree house. This is um, also Havana, uh, Florida. Lower East Side in New York with basketballs. Brooklyn, very near where Ebbets Field used to be. Uh, Eatonville, Florida, home of Zora Neale Hurston. Another uh, church in Richmond that looks very much like churches I see in the South. So when I came back, uh, I did get to New Orleans, and you'll see some of those later, but when I came back, I was commissioned to um, uh, work on a, a public art project in, uh, on Vermont Street in uh, what is now called South Central Los Angeles, but, it, but until uh, prior to the Watts riots was just Central Los Angeles. And this is the first public... Um, sort of county building in this neighborhood since the Rodney King riots. Basically, sort of nothing's happened. There were all these promises that were going to be made. And the, the, it's privately developed, and the developer, who's a photo collector, wanted to have photography and public art. So he basically commissioned six artists to um, uh, work for a month and then do a proposal. And this was a neighborhood I've been looking for in LA for like 30 years. It's not, it's not, it's farther, more central than Compton and Watts. It has a lot of storefront churches. Um, it's half, perhaps slightly more Hispanic. It had all these kind of things that you can kind of see from my work I'm interested in. And I love these converted buildings, you know, the, the whole idea of the theater being used, having different iterations has been real interesting to me. And again, the kind of markings, how, how is both faith expressed 
And the other thing I like about LA is um, if if I need to go someplace really different from the Bay Area, I can go to LA and feel like I'm going to Nepal because the light is different. The light is really different. I think something happened. I think it's really is a different zone. The things that people talk about are different. The colors they wear are different. The cars the, and their interest in cars are different. And, and I always find it really refreshing. So again, uh, I love the fact that people's hearts were on their sleeves. Um, this is the area where Pepperdine University used to be. There's now the Crenshaw Christian Center, which is one of these mega churches with something like 10,000 members. And inside this huge building called the Faith Dome, they have services that are televised. And in fact, they encourage you to sit in the front because they don't like to have empty seats. It's bad for business. So they didn't actually like me taking this picture. In fact, they, um, but it's, it was interesting. So this was a kind of mega church. that's almost corporate in nature. And then right next to it was a very small, multicultural, uh, bilingual um, uh, Pentecostal church where everything was done in two languages. And then in, uh, uh, farther up Crenshaw, this guy has been here for years. Love that sign. And it was interesting that, that I kind of hit this when I had sort of gotten some momentum going. I don't know if I could have taken these pictures. Well, pro I'd like to think I would. But um, I don't know if I would have. Uh, I, I know I'm sort of uh, on a roll because no one questioned me. And we were talking about it. I, you get to hear the story twice. I had a paper route. Ben, you probably heard the story also. I had a paper route when I was a kid. And the only thing I learned from it was that dogs will chase you if you're frightened of them. And that absolutely applies to photography. If you're feeling uncomfortable with what you're doing, people will pick up on it. They actually will pick up on it more in California than in New York, and maybe even, especially in New York. Because in New York, I photographed people doing illegal things they didn't even look up. In California, everybody's in cars. So the idea of actually facing someone face to face is a little more foreign, and people are more suspicious. But if you are, if you know this whole thing about stealing souls, you can only steal someone's soul if that's your intent. I really believe that. And people can pick up on it, and especially um, uh, people of color and people in um, communities that have been under the gun and that have been uh, exploited by media can absolutely, their bullshit detector is um, pretty right on. So it was interesting to me. I could kind of judge by the way people were reacting to me that both I was really into doing this and that maybe my heart was pure, as pure as it could get. So there's sort of the ever-present palm and the representation of it. I photographed, there was a motel, I didn't include it, but it's the motel where Sam Cooke was killed, which is right up the street from, from here. Um, there's like you know, you sort of drive and someone will have four drum sets just set up in an empty lot selling it. And then there's, a, besides the kind of religious iconography, there are these incredible, I think they're really beautiful um, sort of, you know, uh, vernacular expressions of commerce. So right next to the uh, Crenshaw um, Christian Center was a neighborhood called Vermont Knowles, which has some of the nicest houses, housing stock in Los Angeles, 100% African American. In fact, they're very suspicious of this new building. But um, again, people, there's sort of stereotypes about where black people live and what their lives are like. And here was this incredibly immaculately landscaped uh, neighborhood um, that uh, people are fighting to try to live in. A lot of these are on Vermont. Vermont is the second busiest bus travel. People do take buses in LA, contrary to popular. And, and so that was part of the idea was my idea was I wanted to make these photographs large in kind of light boxes that you'd be able to see regardless of how you were passing by uh, vehicle or foot traffic and also if you were using the building.
So my proposal, uh, although I didn't get to reiterate it, was um, uh, I had uh, contracted with um, a, a sign maker and someone who makes these huge boxes for advertising, and I was going to place them on the building. Um, I was actually in the middle of working on the book, so my presentation was to show and be very enthusiastic about the images, which I was actually more interested in even than doing the public art. So what they, they uh, the, someone else is going to do um, the sort of imagery on the outside of the building, but they are, are going to use my photographs of the community inside the building so that the clients will actually see them. And they, I thought, I mean, I was real interested that the, the story was more complex than meets the eye, and I thought it was interested and important that the clients and the people in that community saw a reflection of that, because they know that, but a lot of other people don't. So naturally, I was very disappointed and paying quite close attention to the course of Katrina as it was bearing on New Orleans. Uh, the, the year before, I had been there right after, I can't remember the name of the hurricane that had veered at the last minute. And I hadn't really thought about it, but a lot of people left, and it was interesting, it was really on class lines who left and who didn't. And on the one hand, you know, it would be interesting as a, what am I, as a photographer, social scientist, or the son of social scientists, to have been with, there with the hurricane, because uh, I you know, like to experience it. Of course, everybody who lives there said, are you out of your mind? Uh, and people I know that were stuck there, really, you know, especially after with all that we've heard. So anyway, um, in East St. Louis, um, before New Orleans was closed, you had to show ID, you know, and it, did, it opened up, although there was no way to get there. So I had to rent a car in Memphis, drive through Mississippi, actually took a picture of cotton for the first time. I once drove all the way across the country, and the first place I saw cotton was in Bakersfield. I don't know what that's about. So anyway, but New Orleans is a place I have gone to seven or eight times in the last 12 years. And uh, I you know, was very anxious to go. I went in October, um, but I had been there before. And what I wanted to show you, this is uh, John Scott, who is a, a MacArthur Fellow sculptor who teaches at Xavier University. And this is a spirit house, which is, again, based on the model of the shotgun house. And on the walls are these cutouts that have narratives of the African-American story in Louisiana, the relationship with the Indians. And uh, it was um, built, it's on St. Um, oh, I think it's on St. Bernard's. Um, and so I was very curious to see if it had survived the hurricane. So that was one of the first places I went when I arrived. Um, St. Rock's is in the uh, Bywater. Uh, St. Rock's is the miracle, is the patron saint of miracle cures. And this is a picture I took in 2000 of this chapel. And I'm assuming he must be the patron saint because there are all these braces and um, alleys. And I took this picture uh, in 2004. This is in the chapel. And there's this creche, which is pretty spooky. One thing I have to say about New Orleans and the whole notion of faith, faith seems much more viable when it's 100 degrees and 100% humidity, sort of a particular kind of faith. This is what that chapel looked like in October, and as is this. So the bywater did um, flood. This is the Voodoo Spiritualist Church on uh, Rampart Street. I love the fact that the streets in New Orleans are actually named after jazz, well, it's the other way around. There's a lot of jazz especially, um, well, through the history of jazz, but uh, Basin Street, Rampart Street, I mean, they were based on these streets. And then the other streets are named after the muses. So in 1994, when I first went, I was uh, walking in uh, Treme. This is a Calliope uh, housing project, and I heard music. You know, I was looking for uh, funerals. I knew about the tradition. And here were these um, 15 and 16-year-olds, a uh, brass band, playing better than a lot of professional musicians I know. Um, it turned out that this woman's son had died at sea, and so they were having a wake. And um, the thing that was immediate to me was that sort of expressions of culture in New Orleans are uh, certainly an amalgam of a lot of things. Um, Africa, uh, uh, Native American, Europe, Caribbean. Um, but then there's all these things that are very unique. There are people that do things in New Orleans that they haven't done anywhere else. There's the story of Congo Square. The, sla the French let the slaves play instruments. The Americans did not. Uh, so there's some argument about where jazz invented. But um, the people, the New Orleans apologists, say that that's where it's from. And so, again, um, 
I was going to say without an agenda, I have an agenda, but I'm, I'm sort of interested in, and it was interested in putting these slides together because I'm trying to sort of make some sense of what is the thread that runs, and maybe you can tell me. Um, this is someone playing air guitar outside of a blues club in the French Quarter. Here's, uh, this is actually on Rampart Street. This is in Treme, this is pre-Katrina, and uh, there's a, basically a demonstration to try to fight um, gentrification. Treme, again, has real interesting housing stock. It's right off the French Quarter, and it's sort of, it's changing. This is actually, was at the uh, dedication of the Spirit House. Um, so I finally got to see my, uh, my marching band. This is a Treme brass band. I'm sort of, uh, I, think, I think I see better in black and white. I also see better with non-autofocusing cameras, but I do love my Nikon D70. It was actually a problem during the trip because I was switching back and forth, and, and I don't think I want to keep doing that. So I either I'm going to either go high-end digital or shoot more film and just use digital for taking notes. But don't hold me to that. So you're going to see photographs, uh, you're going to see more in a couple of weeks, but you'll see some post-Katrina photographs. But, and I've been showing them, and I, after four days of being there, I arrived at like 7.30 at night. I stayed with some friends that had literally come back a couple of hours before I had, and they'd been, there for, they'd been gone for a month and a half. It was, the lights were sort of twick, uh, flickering because the power wasn't full. There was nobody on the streets. It was scary. It was very spooky. And I sort of ran out of my car into their house. But um, then I photographed 12 hours a day for five days straight. And then I got uh, destruction fatigue. Um, here's a sort of something in the Katrina um, talking about sellouts. This is taken uh, on the river road between um, Baton Rouge and Louisiana and uh, New Orleans it's called Cancer Alley. It has one of the highest incidents of cancer in the country because of all the petrochemical companies that dump into the water. This is actually in Baton Rouge, a place I've spent some time. I've done um, uh, some things in, I've had some shows there and done some things at LSU. So I've actually been spending time in, as much time in Baton Rouge, although I always go back to New Orleans. This is the Sweet Olive Cemetery, an African-American cemetery that had just, had it been sort of been to ruins and was just starting to be um, uh, restored. And I always thought, this coffee pot was like this what, you know, incredible expression of culture, and I think it is, but it also is a receptacle for the flowers. You know, it always has a practical use. This is a, a, a doll house in the form, in the shape of a shotgun house. Um, it's a crypt for a child. I love that. And then I love these kind of hand scratching on the gravestones. So after having kind of both shown and looked at all my post-Katrina, what I realized was I really missed and was more interested in pre-Katrina or in New Orleans as it was and maybe will be. It seemed appropriate at the time, this is like about 12 years ago, to shoot infrared in New Orleans although it's not necessary because the spirits are already there. This is one of the few cemeteries in New Orleans that were with graves in the grounds, Hope Cemetery, another African-American cemetery. Um, this is in St. Louis Cemetery, and this is Marie Laveau's uh, grave uh, uh, crypt. You know, because the water table's so high, most of the graves are above uh, ground. And there's also this technology um, this is maybe a drawing, but the, there's all these both photographs and drawings on the graves that at least when I've visited over the course of 10 years have not faded at all. I'm not sure. I know the signs we did uh, in Richmond are done with sort of inkjet printers using porcelain inks and then they're fired. So there is, it is possible to now display continuous tone photographs in uh, sort of outside environments. But someone in New Orleans has been hip to this technology before that. So uh, maybe in, in 1999 or something, I said, well, you've got to go to Fats Domino's house. Fats Domino lives in the Lower Ninth Ward, lived, um, has this incredible house with all this nomenclature, and I finally found it. I mean, I didn't know it was the Ninth Ward, but someone um, took me there. 
So I took this picture, which I thought was really interesting, and then um, uh, I was able to get access to the Lower Ninth by being embedded with the National Guard. You'll see a little of that later. Um, and I found his house again. He actually, there was rumors that he had died, but he was rescued from the second story of his house in the back. Um, but this was the graffiti on, fu on front of his house um, because the, the, the rumor was that he was dead. So I, it's interesting. I think I need to print some of these. It, I've sort of lost a little interest in this. I mean, it's incredibly interesting, and I think it fits within my interest. Um, and what was left was a variety of ways that people were leaving their calling cards, or the buildings became sort of the, the wall where news um, was left. I saw this sign and I thought, oh, someone must be doing some kind of like 19th century photo technique. But of course, this is really about restoring wet photographs. It was, I, was, I was thinking, wow, maybe I'll you know, check that out. This is in the lower ninth. In California, I say if um, the earthquake hits, empty your refrigerator. There's, the, there's sort of, um, uh, the refrigerators basically were these toxic that had to be, um, uh, duct tape closed because literally they would explode. <laughs> and uh, the SP, there was a lot of, you know, markings by FEMA and the SPCA, and I couldn't help but think of Moses and the, the, uh, the Nazis and maybe some more benevolent things. And some of the markings were actually really beautiful but they were also kind of spooky. And then there was the ever-present, because especially in a lot of areas, it flooded multiple times. There were these incredible lines all over everything that, that sort of marked where the, and because the water was so toxic, it really did, it sort of etched into a lot of surfaces. And there were sort of the ever-present editorial comments. I guess they're selling t-shirts in the French Quarter. And a lot of, uh, you see a lot of abandoned bus, buses, uh, they were commandeered. So what you're seeing, I shot a lot of black and white, which I'm just sort of getting to. This is in the Cooper Housing Project. You'll see a little bit of that later, which was completely abandoned, and I understand now is actually in pretty good shape, and they won't let the people back. Something like 300,000 abandoned cars in, in New Orleans. So I would say aesthetics are real important to me. That, you know, kind of, I think I do have, there are certain things that I'm very interested in for a variety of reasons. And I, I try to, this is the city park, um, at post, uh, this is the Martin Luther King Library in the Lower Ninth. This is um, the Cooper uh, uh, Housing Project. Um, he was leaving the next week to go to California, but he'd, been, he'd come back after the hurricane and been living there by himself. If you're familiar with um, Southern rap, gold teeth are quite big. So I was on St. Claude's, and actually I saw these guys with Scientology t-shirts in the courtyard of this church. And I was going, what is that about? So of course, it was also a place where the National Guard was. And to even get access, I had to go through six layers of bureaucracy. And I'd sort of given up. Um, I had to call the chief of police. This was right after there was the um, African, the 65-year-old Af African-American teacher was beaten up in the French Quarter. So I was referred to the pub public relations person of the New Orleans police, and he never did call me. But he said, just say, I said it was fine, because I was trying to get access to the National Guard because I couldn't get into the Ninth Ward. So I got a call sort of at the end of the five days when I was really pretty burned out saying, you want to be embedded with the National Guard? And I said, Hell yes. Uh, I couldn't help but obviously thinking about other situations where embedding was going on. There's a lot, I, can't, I thought about Iraq a lot while I was in New Orleans. So I won't, I'll spare you the picture of me posing with an M16, but these were the 18 and 19 year old kids, some of whom would just come back from Iraq and who said New Orleans was much more upsetting to them than 
Iraq was, but and who were not allowed to leave this uh, monastery where they were staying, uh, the con a convent where they were staying. So many of them knew nothing about New Orleans. They knew they were patrolling the Ninth Ward, but they had not been to the French Quarter. Um, it was interesting that a couple of the people, when I asked if I could photograph, a couple of these guys says, no way. And the other one said, well, we're not going to pose for you, but go ahead. That's when I knew maybe I was onto something. A lot of uh, private securities, black water. Um, a lot of people walking around with guns on their hips. This is on Canal Street. So here's, I did get into the, the lower ninth. This was literally right by the barge. I'm not going to show the barge, but there, there was a lot of evidence. Um, you're going to see some work in a couple of weeks of someone who really concentrated on kind of ephemera uh, in New Orleans, someone who's sitting in this room. That, uh, this is the foundation of the house that's behind it. The, the flood complete, it kept it intact, but moved it um, half a block. So when I was there, I actually, they didn't open up the city till the standing water was gone. So I didn't see standing water in New Orleans. This is a picture I took in 1994 on the River Road during a tropical rainstorm. And this is a picture I took leaving the Ninth Ward the first day they allowed people to drive in. They had a fire truck that was rinsing off the cars. It literally, when you walked out of the, the, um, got out of the car in the Ninth Ward, even with a mask on, I would get nauseous. The, the dust was, uh, and I think, I, I understand, it's um, becoming an issue for people that are there. Here's a photograph I took um, in a lunchroom in New Orleans about five years ago, and I thought it was interesting, well, no, it was after 9-11. Um, and in fact, some people think it's supposed to be a representation of New York. It's actually someone trying to make the skyline of New Orleans look like um, New York, and I thought it was interesting that uh, uh, the sort of notion of re New Orleans and disaster, this was kind of a reference to another disaster, was kind of manifested in this kind of Trump little um, uh, mural. So I think that is it. And I'd be very curious if anybody has questions or, or comments. Um, it was interesting to put this show together because, uh, A, I'm sort of realizing how much of my work I haven't gotten to digitize yet. And the, there's a certain thread, but, but things have changed. Um, and some things that I kind of felt I was pretty clear about became less clear as I was putting some work today. There's other things I'm, I'm pretty clear about in terms of the way I'm working. But I'm, I'm interested in your reactions or if anybody has questions. Or if people are ready to eat, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I have a okay. You said at one point you were on the edge of that, which where you can go digital film. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, maybe I'll just use the D70 for taking notes. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that folks might be, I'm interested okay. in So that implies you're using photography in a certain way as uh, an investigation. Or, how, how, what do you mean when you say you're going to take notes? What would you use them for? I have to say. You, Well, I think the, probably the most boring thing I can imagine, and there's a lot of people that do it, and a lot of people get pleasure that they like to talk about equipment. In fact, there, there is a great, it doesn't exist anymore, there's this famous swap meet in um, uh, Oakland that it was every Sunday. It was always a great place to find used equipment. But there were people that would go every day, and they never took a picture. All they did was talk about equipment. But I do think that the tool, I really feel it's important the tools you use are very important. I, um, I think I bought a couple times cameras with autofocus and zooms and, and couldn't use them. You know, they, I, I knew I could tell. I mean, I would borrow them or rent them. Um, the sort of more help I have seeing, the worse I see. It's changed a little bit because my eyesight is left. But so I had, a, I had three Leicas and they were all stolen. So I had this decision. I am going to change, because I love the Leica, but it was small, it's too convenient. So I'm going to get something that's more of a pain. I also use a lot of the black and white. I use a Fuji 6x9, which is called a Texas Leica. It looks like a Leica on steroids. It's a rangefinder that shoots 6x9 images. 
Uh, so I like it because it's the biggest negative I can make hand holding without using a, a view, uh, like a press camera. Um, but I finally found the this Nikon and Canon and a couple other people made digital cameras for people like me because the one thing I did not could not tolerate was pushing the shutter and it not going. So most of the the newer generation cameras don't take long to recycle because the idea is I. I want to take the picture when it's happening. I don't want anything else to get in the way of that, including autofocus. So I actually surprisingly really like this camera. It's a, a, a single lens reflex. It looks like a film camera. It came with a zoom lens. I said, I'll, and uh, ideally, I, I was going to be able to use my lens as you can, but it doesn't translate. I had, you know, fixed focus lenses. So I've been using it a lot. In fact, I use it exclusively for a while, but I knew, and, and I use it to make a living. I do a lot of architectural photography. It's great. I can make, give files that the architects can use, uh, use it for architectural preservation. Um, and so it's, I know it's part of my... Is that no, that's not note-taking. That's, that is using it. On this trip, uh, my uh, rationalization was I would use the digital camera to get instant feedback to make pictures that were good, but the real serious photographs would be in black and white. But, you know, sometimes, it depended on which camera I had in my hands. It, they got in each other's way in that way. So in terms of that kind of work, this kind of uh, my own personal investigation, I have some decisions to make. Um, uh, and so in that case, Either I'll leave the digital at home and just shoot film or keep it in the bag and, and shoot more film. Because what happened was there's some pictures that I should have taken in black and white that didn't exist anymore. So that's, but I, you know, I, I'm not, the other alternative would be to get a $3,000, you know, 20 megapixel digital camera. And then, because what I want to do is be able to make big pictures. My question wasn't really directed towards the technical. Right. Right. I want the materials and the medium to be as close to translating my ideas as possible. There are sometimes when digital does do that, and sometimes when it absolutely does not. And I don't know if I can be any clearer than that. I it is you know I kept saying oh, I hate technology. I'm a leadite. Of course, this is as I'm trying to find my Palm Pilot and my. You know, so that that's obviously not the case. And um, we were talking about it. Whatever I have, usually I learn whatever else I can do when I need to do it. And I think that's that's the case in terms of photography. Um, so I think maybe ultimately every picture I take is note taking, and I need to find a variety. I want the sort of ways to translate my reaction to things. I mean, I use the camera. We talked about that. The camera really is my excuse to go into places. I have no business in being. And so I want the tool I use that records that experience to be something I feel comfortable with and that does what I want to do it. In the case of the medium format camera, it allows me, if I scan them, to be able to, I can make 45, 48 inch prints if I want. It's harder, I can't do that with a D70 because it, it makes too small a file. So I don't, I, you know, I'm doing the very thing I said I don't like, but I, it's I, I'm kind of into talking about the tools enough that so I know if there's something else I can use that will allow me to do what I need to, I will. Uh, I'll I'll get that, or I'll find out about it, or in a lot of cases I'll ask one of my students about it because they may know more about it than I do. Yes. I'm curious about uh, sort of this act of like recognition while you're traveling, mm -hmm. it's sort of like. You know, here's the hometown of Zero Neil Hurston, or here's the block next to where Sam Cooke was killed, or this is where Fats Domino's house mm -hmm. is. And it's almost like there's a certain sort of cultural consciousness that these places sort of blossom from, and mm -hmm. kind of recording that with the camera. I'm, I'm curious to talk about that because it's it's one way to kind of define a really complete um, sort of idea of culture uh, by moving. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder like how that differs from Oakland. Well, you know, I, I sort of like to say, well, I just go places and react to places, but I very directed and structured the places I go to then riff, if I am riffing. I mean, in other words, I place myself in a particular situation and then react to certain circumstances. Uh, I know in 
a um, lot of communities of color, I'm going to find examples of improvisation. Um, I'm also going to find out sort of things like in the Third Ward, um, that lot is where Lightning Hopkins was raised. And that's interesting to me because it tells me a little bit about, um, I mean, it's sort of thrilling to me. I have some problems with the South, and actually I can usually only be in the South for about two weeks at a time, but I keep going back because uh, the South is a very dynamic area on a lot of different levels. But kind of those, those manifestations of culture are real important because they, they sort of give me, they sort of help inform me in terms of kind of the things I'm reacting to, maybe not as instinctively I'd like to state. And, and so uh, sometimes I find those things after the fact. Sometimes I find them in the course, the, the, the act of photographing opens up the conversation. You know, people say, so what are you doing? And I'll say, I'm, you know, real interested in kind of finding reflections of culture and history you know, in this block, and someone will say, well, you know, so-and-so used to be there, or you should knock on that door. It, it opens up things, and some of the stories are, you know, kind of, uh, kind of national significance, and some of them, and probably more interesting, are, are personal. So it's kind of both an excuse and the, the vehicle by which I um, can both drive the work and can inform the sort of aesthetic decisions I'm making. I think that answers it. Yes? And then we, we had a photographer who always looks at the high point of a city and takes an image down to the local Oh, yes. Looking at the, um, the photographs in, in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, if you ever have a, a tendency or a wish to photograph from on high, uh, or whether the subject matter that you take is always uh, with your feet on the ground. I think my tendency is I want to get as close to it as possible. I don't like telephoto lenses. I don't photograph with them very well. I know people that photograph really well. I need to have, be sort of in physical contact with what I photograph. I mean, I do, and I do, uh, like if I can get to a place where I can kind of see more context, I will do that. But I think my first inclination is to get close to something. I think that shows in the work. Um, I, I'm kind of interested in the detail. I'm very interested in the kind of bones of things and the texture, uh, both the sort of physical texture. I actually hate when students say that. Yes, I was real interested in the, but I am interested in that, so I can't, you know. Um, but I'm interested in it for what it reflects, the kind of, you know, that what's, what always I loved about New Orleans is, uh, you know, before the hurricane, it already looks, because it, it, the climate is so hard that the patina of everything is just absolutely spectacular because it's there. And so I, I want to get close enough that that'll show in the photographs. Is there, is there any kind of a set-up shot? I, mean, I don't know what, I mean, something that gives you an entry point that is a larger context than the details that you find? Yeah, I, I, I don't, I think... I like to have some hint of where something is, or I'll at least do that in the photographs, and then I have a decision to make, you know, whether I'm going to include that or not. Um, uh, you know, sometimes I'll take one picture, sort of whatever it feels like, and leave. But I think my tend my uh, way of working usually is to kind of linger at a place and um, kind of look at it from different areas, or angles, or look at that phenomenon as it exists, say in a number of different iterations. Yeah. What's your personal uh, position regarding government's action, uh, Katrina? Because you never mentioned anything when you were talking about it. And, I don't know, the contrast between the photos and... I don't know, actually well, I, I'd be interested. I will answer that. From the photographs, what would you think my... Is there any hint in the images? <laughs> and there may not be, you know... The thing is, you said that you were going to go there initially before the hurricane. Right. And it, to me, it seems like you sort of photographed as if the hurricane wouldn't have happened. Well, with respect, but yeah, no. Know, like, it still has that sort of quest that you have, uh, that, that way of looking that uh, it continues uh, regarding the uh, geography uh, as geography changes. Well, it's interesting that I have shown a like 150 image presentation of post-Katrina work, I think four or five times in the last couple of months. 
And the last two times I showed it, I was sick of it. It was sort of like I, it was sort of like that's not, I mean, I obviously was drawn there. I had to go there and I wanted to photograph it. But I'm more interested in, I mean, one of the things that I missed, I was there literally the first time after the hurricane when you could go there without having to show ID, you know, that's, I went made a beeline. And, and the thing that happened, almost everybody I knew was not there. The streets were empty. There's incredible devastation, which actually I haven't seen a photograph that really shows, including my own. I made a decision, I've made a decision now, and I think I'm going to revisit it because I haven't really printed it, that, that that's not, the destruction pictures are of less interest to me, and they don't even really speak to really what's going on. They don't speak to the fact that people have been displaced. They don't speak to the fact that the Lower Ninth Ward had something like 60 or 70 percent homeowners. They don't, I didn't show it. There's an area called Lakeview, which was a middle class, primarily white area that was right by the 7th Avenue Canal, which had much, it's on landfill, it had houses that are probably 30 or 40 years old, except for where the barge basically leveled houses. The house damage was actually worse in Lakeview because those houses weren't as well made as the earlier houses. Um, uh, but I'm more interested in, like, I live in Richmond. And that was settled by a lot of people from Louisiana. And there's not shotgun houses in Richmond, but they're, the way people personalize their spaces with iron fences looks exactly like the Ninth Ward. It's really amazing. So that, you know, I guess for this talk, I was more interested in the whole idea of transference um, and, at least for here, Less, I'm less interested in the effects of the hurricane, the physical effects of the hurricane. I'm, I am very interested in the social. I'm also interested in terms of when I talk to people, you know, there are all these stories. Well, there were stories that there were gangs of black people killing people in the Garden District, which wasn't true. There were stories that multiple people were raped in the Astrodome, which was also not true. People were smoking crack and it was horrendous. But it was interesting that the hurricane, well, what it did reflect is the, the, I love New Orleans, but I also hate it because of the racism. The racism is almost breathtaking. It's so palpable. And that's one of the things I don't like about the South. And I, I don't want to, you know, um, uh, there's some things that uh, Faulkner said in the South, the past isn't really the past and history is right just below the surface. And that's absolutely the truth. And that's, those are things I'm really interested in photographing, but there's also elements about that I am disgusted by and can't be around for long periods of time. So, but I did really was very upset to not have a chance to be in New Orleans. Uh, I was going to be at the uh, Ogden Museum of Southern Art because there, New Orleans is an incredible art center. There's I sort of said New Orleans is a place where there's not much mediocrity. There's incredible genius and incredible incompetence. And there's, there are um, artists, incredible artists, artists that we don't even know, visual artists, musicians, uh, acting. And I, I, in the course of visiting, have gotten a chance to meet some of them. But, and this would have been a chance to sort of get you know, further below the sur beneath the surface. And I guess at this point, because I've been dealing with the destruction, I'm much more interested in kind of what New Orleans was and what it will be. I, I'm going to go in May and kind of uh, work with a colleague of mine, um, and we're going to kind of examine how the, something like the Jazz Fest and the role of culture, whether that will be used to make New Orleans into a boutique or a theme park or to sort of bring back what was before. And as someone told me, it's probably going to be a combination of both. All right, thank you.